This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is the kind of bitterly cold weather that reminds those of us who have housing just how lucky we are. Surviving in this cold weather without a home isn't easy and addiction can complicate everything. Tonight, CBC's Josh Crabb brings us the story of a man who hobbled into the hospital over the weekend with frostbite. Early Saturday morning, the temperature was in the mid-minus 20s. Robert, who CBC isn't identifying to protect his privacy, says he was in psychosis from using methamphetamine and didn't think a shelter would take him in because he was high. He went into a porta potty and walked out in need of a hospital. I had severe frostbite on my on my feet. Uh, by the time I had the sense to leave the porta potty and realized that there wasn't anybody there waiting for me. Robert walked with frostbitten feet from near the Disraeli Bridge to St. Boniface Hospital, where he says he was treated and stayed overnight. He was discharged later in the day and came to this warming centre on St. Mary's Road, run by St. Boniface Street Links. Executive Director Marion Willis says he isn't the only one here with a cold-related injury. Well, there's a fellow in the corner over there with his leg and feet bandaged. He's on crutches. It's been a challenging and dangerous few days for people who don't have a permanent place to live with temperatures dropping below minus 30. The cold snap isn't over yet, leaving some in Winnipeg in search of the most basic necessities like shelter and food. People that have next to nothing, we're all supporting each other just by simple things of bread and getting it what we need. The frostbite Robert suffered is a risk many face. He says the doctor working the overnight shift wanted him admitted to hospital, but a different physician determined he could be discharged. He just made a different determination and that was that I, I could go to the shelters, which in many cases are full. He ended up at the warming shelter several hours after leaving hospital. In terms of my physical health, I was very well cared for. It's the mental health piece, which is actually the driver of the problems with my physical health, that is, um, isn't, uh, isn't really getting addressed. The Winnipeg Regional Health Authority won't speak to specific cases, but a spokesperson says clinicians work with people who are unsheltered to figure out a plan for their discharge from hospital. That work includes consulting with a social worker and connecting with shelters. If they feel it's unsafe for a patient to leave, the discharge won't happen. Josh Crabb, CBC News, Winnipeg. Winnipeg City Council has had a chance today to learn how to administer naloxone, a medication that can reverse an opioid overdose. Mayor Scott Gillingham organized this seminar for counselors and their assistants. Paramedic Corey Guest explained how naloxone works, showed how it's administered, and even gave counselors a chance to test out the needles on artificial skin. Eight out of 15 counselors attended. I found out that um, anytime you run across someone that has a respiratory uh, distress and you suspect it could be opioids, uh, your number one thing is to use naloxone. Now that we have some training, it may be that we as, you know, are, are in a position sometime to, to administer these life-saving drugs. Counselors will have naloxone kits in their offices. Physicians spend 10 to 11 hours per week on administrative work. And according to a new report by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, more than a third of that is unnecessary. In Manitoba, that adds up to 1.6 million hours per year, or what could have been 1.8 million more visits with six people, sick people rather, in this province. Doctors Manitoba President Candace Bradshaw says paperwork is burning many doctors out and stopping others from being able to take on new patients. I can tell you as a family physician, I'm not currently accepting new patients. And any time the thought of accepting patients crosses my mind, the first barrier to saying yes to that is the thought of how much paperwork is that going to increase on my load already. Bradshaw says the provincial government committed last November to forming a joint task force on how to reduce the administrative burden on doctors. She says so far, there has been no movement on the issue. 
People in Swan River are pleading for aid from the provincial and federal governments to help curb the rising crime rate in their community. The town's been inundated by crimes like shoplifting, break and enter, and property damage. It has residents and business owners rattled. CBC's Chelsea Kemp has the story. Witnessing crimes has become a part of daily life in Swan River. Residents and businesses are now taking matters into their own hands, trying to protect themselves and their property. Many have installed security cameras, put bars on their windows, and used buzzers to let people into stores during shopping hours. Denise Ashcroft was born and raised in Swan River. She always felt safe in the community, but the level of crime has left her afraid for her friends, family, and business. I've had two break-ins last summer that cost me thousands of dollars and now I have cameras and now I have bars on my windows which I'd never in my life would have thought we would have had in Swan River. I've never had to lock my door in between customers. I'm, I'm afraid to go to the bank. I'm afraid to go outside to my car. Swan River's most recent crime severity index, which measures the seriousness of offenses, suggests crimes in the town is four times the provincial average. Businesses in the municipality are doing what they can to address crime in the community, but Swan River's mayor says the provincial and federal governments need to do more. We are uh, the worst right now in the province, not necessarily in the country, but we are the worst in the province when it comes to that index. And, and I think that it's time for the province to, to and the federal government to realize that we have an issue here. A group of businesses have started sharing information, tracking known offenders and sharing crime prevention tips. The hope is to deter crimes in the community until long-term solutions can be found. What we're doing is um, because we're not getting a lot of help, I would say, from, from, from the, uh, the, the provincial or federal um, side of government, that uh, we're looking at things that we can do ourselves as business owners. A special meeting is planned at the end of the month to try and tackle crime in the community. The goal is to come up with solutions on their own and press the provincial and federal justice systems to do more to help. Chelsea Kemp, CBC News, Brandon. Premier Heather Stephenson is giving some suburban Winnipeg MLAs a higher profile. She's promoted four of them to cabinet. As the CBC's Ian Fraze explains, that means more exposure for those MLAs. A standing ovation from a friendly crowd. Our best days, I can tell you, my friends, are yet to come. Premier Heather Stephenson continued Monday to put her stamp on her government. She used her second cabinet shuffle since becoming premier in late 2021 to promote four backbenchers. St. River MLA Janice Morley Lecomte is a new mental health minister. James Teitzma of Radisson is minister of government services. The other newcomers narrowly won by-elections in the last year. Fort White's Abi Khan is now minister of sport, culture and heritage. And Kevin Klein of Kirkfield Park is Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. What they all have in common is they represent suburban Winnipeg. These are seats the Tories are in danger of losing, some more than others, in the election slated for the fall. Voters who don't necessarily pay much attention to politics, they will hear on occasion the names of, of the cabinet ministers. So they say, oh, that's my MLA, that's my MLA. And if you're in a seat that's that might be challenged, um, it is important to be in cabinet. Some cabinet ministers got new jobs. Cliff Cullen goes from leading economic development to finance. He takes over from Cameron Friesen, who is stepping down to seek the federal conservative nomination for Portage Liskar. Eileen Clark returns to the Indigenous Reconciliation Portfolio. And John Reyes leads the new Department of Labor and Immigration. Stephenson is framing this cabinet shuffle as a refresh. Today we are gathered here to reflect on the importance of hope and renewal, which is vital in pretty much every aspect of our lives, but it's also vital in government. She doesn't have much choice. Of the 36 PCMLAs in the legislature a year ago, a third of them have either resigned or declared they won't seek re-election. Those departures include Cullen and Clark, both of whom are staying in cabinet. Let's remember why this cabinet shuffle is happening, and that's because everyone's quitting on the PCs. 
and their bench is so thin that they're now appointing one of the quitters to be finance minister when they should be working on the budget. But Stephenson says a mix of new faces and veterans is vital. Having that experience around the table, but also bringing in new, so they can help, you know, a little bit with tra training some of the uh, the new cabinet ministers as well. Along with Cameron Friesen, two other ministers not seeking re-election, Reg Helwer and Alan Lajamodier, have been dropped from cabinet. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. There are three other cabinet ministers who are changing portfolios. They're Jeff Wharton, who will be in charge of economic development. Andrew Smith will lead municipal relations. And Sarah Guillemard will be in charge of advanced education. Police are investigating a homicide after a Winnipeg man was found dead inside a Main Street hotel on Sunday evening. Police say 40-year-old Carl George Westcoop was found inside one of the suites at the Manwin Hotel. He died of severe injuries. A man who was in the hospital already with serious injuries had told police there might be another injured man at the hotel. That's how they found him. Police say no suspects have been arrested. Anyone with information is asked to call police or give Crime Stoppers the information. RCMP are asking for help locating a 12-year-old girl. Zoe Shorting has been missing since January 23rd. She's from Little Saskatchewan First Nation. The investigation has led police to think she may be in the Polo Park area of Winnipeg in the company of an unknown male youth. Police and her family are worried about her well-being. If you have any information, you're asked to call RCMP, specifically Gypsumville RCMP, or again, Crime Stoppers. Legendary hockey player Bobby Hull has died. Hull, who played professional hockey from 1957 to 1980, helped the Chicago Blackhawks win the Stanley Cup. He also won the WHA Avco Cup in Winnipeg three times. Hull was a fan favorite, but as Karen Pauls reports, he was also a controversial figure. That speed and slap shot is what made Bobby Hall a scoring sensation. Well, Bobby Hall was a, a player who used every inch of the ice back when he played. But more importantly, he had a slap shot that was, that was um, caught at going 118 miles an hour. In 1961, Hall helped lead Chicago to its first Stanley Cup in 23 years. He was the first NHL player to score more than 50 goals in a single season. He's still 55th on the NHL's all-time scoring list. I'm sure that our league is going to get under motion and we're going to have some real fine hockey. In 1972, Hall became the first hockey player to earn a million dollars, leaving the NHL to sign with the Winnipeg Jets of the Upstart World Hockey Association. Bobby Hull was arguably the greatest hockey player around in the late 60s and early 70s. A golden jet on the ice, a fan favorite off the ice. But there was controversy too. There were uh, documented episodes of violence against his second wife, Joanne, um, that he did not deny and, and, and in fact uh, confirmed in uh, court. Although Hull denied it later, he allegedly told an English language newspaper in Russia that Hitler had some good ideas but went a little bit too far. You could make a case that he's the most influential figure uh, in hockey history to that point. And uh, really, he should be in the conversation with Gretzky in terms of his, his influence. But he's not. And it's simply because of the personal history that has come out. Hey, Joe, how you, how you doing? Well, it's a sad day, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. But that's not what Hull's former teammates are remembering him for. Most of the goaltenders he faced... Uh, were a little scared of, and uh, and they didn't like that uh, slap shot coming at their head. I had my eyes shut most of the time, so I really don't. I really don't know. An influence on current Jets too. He was a great player for this organization, but also in terms of you know building and making and helping what the NHL is today. Just an, uh, it's an unreal hockey player. It's obviously the stats will tell it speak for itself. Bobby Hall! The Winnipeg Jets are planning a memorial ahead of tonight's game. Bobby Hall was 84. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg.
Meteorologist John Sauter joins us now. This extreme cold warning, how far does it stretch? Yeah, almost. It's actually right now easier to name the regions in Manitoba that aren't in, a, in an extreme cold warning. Uh, the Hudson Bay Coast uh, and areas around Norway House, Flin Flon, the Pond, and it's mostly about criteria. It's still very cold there. And there's a lot of concentration on the wind chill number, and I talked about this in some of our social media platforms last week. It's more about how quickly your skin can freeze, right? Right, so, that frostbite risk. Exactly, so that's what I'm gonna start with tonight. We'll look at wind chill values and how the average minutes to freeze skin really will affect you. So through the evening hours here, we'll have a wind chill value at around minus 33. That's actually what it is right about now with our temperature and our wind combined, which wind today has been gusty enough, up to about 40 kilometers per hour. But that's a 20-minute freeze time. So taking the dog out for a walk, you're going to have to cover the skin. Now, into tomorrow morning, we get ranges around minus 38 to minus 40, so that's 10 to 11 minute freeze time. So that's a very short period of time. And that's why I, I obviously tomorrow outdoor recesses for kids will be canceled, that sort of thing. They'll keep the kids inside. Right now, winds are 30 kilometers per hour. There's your temperature, there's your wind chill factor. So again, it's right around that 19, 20 minutes on exposed skin. This is the warning for Southern Manitoba. It covers all regions, also into Saskatchewan and a big chunk of Northwestern Ontario. And then we go to the North and we see See those areas I mentioned with Janet that are not in the warning, but you need a wind chill value that's around minus 50 in Churchill to get a, an extreme cold warning. I do see those numbers possible tonight, so we may see a warning uh, issued there, and across the north we've got that extreme cold warning as well. Not much to see on satellite today, just a little bit of cloud around the Red River Valley, fairly clear right across the north, and that will last into tonight. There's a glimmer of hope at the end of this graphic, okay? So watch very carefully. Now, all of the blue is obviously the, the really cold stuff. We get a bit of a milder trend on Wednesday with a bit of light snow. I'll tell you more about that in a second. Then on Thursday, we're back into sun, and Thursday is going to be like today, one of the coldest days of the week. And then you look at Saturday, and here's the glimmer of hope I'm talking about, some ridging in the west, and it starts to get into the eastern prairies by about Saturday afternoon. This is not tropical weather. This is just back to seasonal, around minus 11, minus 12. Pretty clear right through Tuesday. And then Wednesday, we see that cloud increasing from the west. There's a look at the morning hours. And then on into the afternoon, some snow to our northwest. On into the evening, a good band of snow, about two, maybe three centimeters on Wednesday evening. But it's gone by Thursday, and we are right back into the sunshine. Tonight's low in Winnipeg, minus 29. That'll be our morning temperature as well. Wind won't be as frisky tomorrow, only at about 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. High, minus 19. That's very close to what it was today. And then uh, some evening snow Wednesday, a high of only minus 24 on Thursday. Friday morning, we're at minus 32. And then cold on Friday with uh, some cloud and a chance of flurries as well. Thank you very much, John. Checking with, with yeah. you later. I should note, Janet, that when it's this cold, really need to take care of the pets. Yes, you do, sir. In fact, if it's too cold for you to stay outside, it's also too cold for your pet to stay outside. But what about walking them, like John mentioned? Is that even safe for them in this kind of extreme weather? I spoke with a certified professional dog trainer about that this afternoon. Annalie Lowe's, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Who's that with you? This is Wilson. Uh, he is one of my dogs. He's a four-year-old uh, miniature schnauzer mix. I got him from a, a local rescue in Winnipeg. Well, good for you. I'm very happy for you. Um, I'm a dog owner too, and I often wonder if it's safe in these kind of cold temperatures to walk a dog outside. What do you say? I mean, it's very dependent on uh, the breed of your dog. So, um, Dogs like Huskies or Malamutes, dogs that have those big, thick coats, typically can handle the cold a lot better. Um, but dogs that maybe have a little less hair, um, so dogs like Wilson, um, it can actually be quite dangerous. Um, and they still, uh, they have the same risks of frostbite, just like we do. Well, I'd worry especially about, about their paws. Do you, uh, what do you recommend for keeping them protected? We uh, recommend to people to get their dogs booties. Um, not all dogs love wearing them, um, but 
when you bring them home, um, having your dog wear them around the house is a good place to get started and just giving them treats every time they're wearing them um, and just starting to build a, a positive association so that when you do have to pull them out, um, that isn't something that your dog's going to hate. So dogs really, uh, dog boots really do make a difference? Yes, especially um, if you get ones that are made for the winter. Um, there are some, uh, depending on the pet store you go to, that are more like socks. Um, but there are some that um, are made for winter weather. Do you have a cutoff when you just say, even with boots on the dog, it's just too cold? Um, for me, these temperatures, that would be my, my cutoff. Um, you know, anything past you know, minus 35 with the wind chill, uh, it's just too darn cold for them, <laughs> especially for walks, right? Um, they still have to go outside to do their business, but um, there are other ways that we'll, we'll exercise our dogs when it reaches those temperatures. Like how? How do you exercise them? Um, well, we always recommend turning meal times um, into training time. So rather than putting your dog's food right in their bowl, um, using that food to uh, practice some behaviors your dog might already know. So, you know, their sits, their downs, their stays, um, going on YouTube and searching up, you know, cute dog tricks um, and teaching your dog something new, finding ways to really work their brain um, because a tired dog uh, that is that has a lot of mental enrichment, um, is just as important as a tired dog who's gone for a long walk. Um, and we also will recommend to people that may not have the time to, you know, put in training uh, in, on a given day to uh, still ditch the food bowl, um, but use things like treat balls um, or different interactive toys uh, to feed their dogs. So their mealtime lasts longer and they're also having to work a little bit to get all that food. So you think it's mental enrichment that's just as important as physical? Absolutely. Um, you know, even when it's not cold out, we always tell people, you know, you can run your dog for an hour, but if they haven't had to think, right, their, their brain is still going. So, you know, the way that we usually think about it is, you know, when you're doing your taxes <laughs> and you have to spend all that brain power doing all that math, at the, end of the t at the end of the day, you're probably pretty tired. Whereas, you know, if you go for an hour walk, you might be a little tired for, you know, a few minutes afterwards, but then you're typically fine. So working their brain is just as important as working their body, if not more important. Okay, so uh, another minute with you. I sometimes see people wearing, uh, their dogs are in like a, like a little snowsuit. What do you think of snowsuits? Uh, we love snowsuits. Um, my when well, my dog Wilson has to wear a snowsuit <laughs> anytime he goes out to go to the bathroom in this weather. Um, so we definitely recommend them. Um, most pet stores that you'll go to will have lots of different options. Um, we usually recommend one that covers the most of their bodies. So whether that's um, a jacket that has a long back um, or even a full snowsuit where they have pants attached to the jacket. So it's full legs, full body coverage. Emily Lowe's, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. MPs were back in Parliament today after a six week break. We'll show you what topped the agenda when we return. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Welcome back. Healthcare, safety and the economy topped the agenda today as MPs resumed after a six week break. As David Cochran reports, this resumption of sitting comes a week before the Prime Minister meets with the Premiers. As winter blankets Ottawa, MPs return to Parliament and the leader of the NDP tries to flex some political muscle. The for-profit privatization, the American style healthcare system that Doug Ford and Daniel Smith are proposing, it's only going to make things worse. Singh pushed for an emergency parliamentary debate on for-profit private health care, a week ahead of the Prime Minister hosting the Premiers for a health care summit, with some provinces keen to embrace more private care. I'm not surprised the Conservatives support this approach. They believe in for-profit private health care. But I am surprised with the Prime Minister. Why the flip-flop? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I and the Liberal government have always been very, very clear. We stand for a public health system that fully abides by the Canada Health Act. While the New Democrats focused on health care, the Conservatives looked to blame the Liberals for a long and growing list of problems. We have 32 percent increase in crime. We have the TTC transit system in downtown Toronto overtaken by crime. From a surge in violent crime to the rising cost of living. When will this Prime Minister and Canada's worst money manager in Canadian history stop breaking Canada, rein in his spending and making the price of everything go up? Mr. Speaker, we know that many Canadians are facing real challenges and that's why our government is there to help. It's a new sitting of Parliament that's picking up where the old one left off, with the ongoing crisis in health care and the struggles of ordinary Canadians to make ends meet dominating the agenda. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The government of Quebec is objecting to the federal government's new representative who's assigned to fight Islamophobia. It says Emira al Gawabi is anti-Quebec, based on what she's written about the province's secularism law. Rafi Bujikanyan reports. Just one morning after the six-year anniversary of the shooting at a Quebec City mosque that took the lives of six men, Quebec is an endroit très accueillant. Quebec's deputy premier defended her government's position, asking Canada's newly appointed special representative on combating Islamophobia to resign. Prétendre le contraire, je trouve ça très glissant. Adding she finds pretending Quebecers are not welcoming while your job is taxpayer-funded to be a problem. At issue, this op-ed Amira El Gawabi co-wrote for Post Media Papers in 2019, opposing Quebec's secularism law which bans public sector workers from wearing religious symbols. It cited an opinion poll which found 88% of Quebecers who held negative views on Islam favoured the ban, equating that to anti-Muslim sentiment. We have lots of work to do on the battlefield of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and racism. The piece's co-author springing to her defense. I think it's time for politicians to stop, take stock of what they're saying. L'honorable député de belle chambly The federal opposition Bloc Québécois wants more clarity on her remarks. Their leader wants to meet her. Trudeau offering to facilitate that, but he's also defending his government's choice to journalists. Obviously, she has thought carefully over many years about the impacts uh, that various pieces of legislation, various political positions have had. While Conservatives are also saying she needs to go. Prime Minister Trudeau appointed someone who has spent the last years with confrontation, with divisive speech. El Gawabi herself has said her article was never meant to paint Quebecers as a whole as Islamophobic. The federal government has not said whether it was aware of the former journalist's remarks when it appointed her to her current job. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. A bomb exploded today at a mosque in northern Pakistan, killing at least 59 people. The blast happened during afternoon prayers. As Salima Shivji reports, most of the victims were police officers. A stunned silence as the grief sets in for the dozens of injured. Victim after victim rushed to hospital in Peshawar, in Pakistan's northwest. As the search for survivors became more frantic. Nearly 60 worshippers dead, with the toll expected to rise. 
The suspected suicide attack was timed to hit a packed Shia mosque, shattering the tranquility of afternoon prayers, ripping through a wall and bringing down parts of the roof. We were preparing for prayer, this man says. We were on the stairs when the blast hit inside. He and others rushed to rescue the wounded, leaving many behind already dead, trapped under the rubble. We took out seven injured worshippers, this social worker says, but two died on the way to the hospital. Most of the victims were officers, hundreds working inside a highly secure compound that was somehow compromised. Within hours, Pakistan's prime minister met with survivors of the blast, calling the scale of the tragedy unimaginable. An attack on Pakistan, Shabazz Sharif called it. Terrorism is our foremost national security challenge, he wrote on Twitter. An increasingly unwieldy challenge. Peshawar, tucked near the border with Afghanistan, has seen its share of militant attacks, and even more so recently. There's been a surge after a ceasefire between the Pakistani Taliban and government forces crumbled. A security situation that's rapidly deteriorating, leaving those in mourning also searching for answers as they bury their dead. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. The U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, met with the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, today. The two discussed several issues, including Iran. We agree that Iran must never be allowed to acquire a nuclear weapon. And we discussed deepening cooperation to confront and counter Iran's destabilizing activities uh, in the region and beyond. Blinken also addressed the increasing violence between Israelis and Palestinians. He condemned a Palestinian attack outside a synagogue last Friday, which killed seven people. But he's also calling for Israeli restraint. A recent Israeli raid on militants in the West Bank left 10 people dead. Blinken says American support of Israel remains, quote, ironclad, unquote, and he continued to push for a two-state solution. Meteorologist John Sauter is going to be back with a look at the Manitoba forecast so we can see what the weather's like for the entire province. We also have an interesting interview with an artist still ahead. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Well, it may not be as big a problem here in Winnipeg at Richardson International, but at other airports, it's a familiar scene. Growing piles of lost luggage in airports. Sophia Harris looks at the missing baggage buildup and what's being done about it. I feel extremely angry. Deborah Cleary was exasperated uh, I... after waiting more than a month for her suitcase. It disappeared when flying from Italy back to Montreal on Air Canada. Two weeks ago, Cleary returned to the Montreal airport to search again. There were just bags that were piling up and piling up. But hers was still nowhere to be found. I'm just sort of desperate to get my bag back. Baggage problems first emerged in the summer. The airlines blamed staffing shortages. Then in December, the cause was massive winter storms disrupting flights. Delays equal missing bags. This former Air Canada executive says Ottawa needs to provide more funding to help keep airport operations running smoothly. There's obviously a need for better uh, infrastructure, better resources for airports to make them more resilient to these uh, weather events. There's also the problem of locating missing bags. We zoomed in on Google Maps and it is a public storage facility. Nikita Reese was able to track the whereabouts of her husband's missing suitcase thanks to an AirTag tracker inside the bag. Even so, Air Canada declared the luggage lost. The most frustrating thing about it was we had no way of getting it. Even though we knew the location and we told the airline so many times. My bag! She finally got the bag back last week, more than four months after it had disappeared during a flight home from Greece. Minister Al Gabra, Ian the transport minister says airline airlines need to step up their game. It's frustrating that airlines still have not uh, modernized their luggage handling system. Air Canada says its baggage operations have returned to normal and that Reese got $2,300 compensation. Following a CBC News inquiry to Air Canada, Cleary also got her suitcase back. It's just been a series of frustrations. Ottawa says it's beefing up its air passenger rights regulations, which may include new rules for missing baggage. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, from luggage being lost somehow <laughs> on the land when you're flying to something that could be flying overhead. Yeah, you know what? If you, uh, if you really want to see a comet and you're willing to get up in the pre-dawn hours and get dressed up really warm with binoculars or a telescope, you might be able to see it. Have a look at this. Now, this is called the Green Comet, and um, it, has a, it has a more technical name. It's actually Comet 2022 E3ZTF. I didn't give it that name. Visible now through early February, uh, closest to Earth on February 2nd. We haven't even had a passage of this comet in 50,000 years. Not sure who figured that out. Uh, you will need binoculars or a telescope. Now, where to look in the sky? I think north and then a little bit left because in mid-January it was east. February 5th, you look to the northwest. So just off of north to the left. And again, it won't be as bright as Neowise was a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago. That was really something, but this one will be something to see. So have a look in the next couple of early mornings, but you need to dress for it. Downtown, we're still at minus 20. That was our high today, minus 23 right now in Selkirk. Everyone pretty close to that number, uh, minus 23, minus 24 now in the Kenora area. Up to the north, we're still at minus 30 in Churchill. Never made it past that number today, and it's even colder tomorrow. So you look at tonight's forecast and there's just a lot of clear sky here and a lot of cold temperatures. Now what I've done is instead of putting the wind chill number, I've given you, I've sort of done the calculation in minutes to freeze your exposed skin for the nighttime and early morning temperatures and winds combined. So you keep an eye on this little line below the number, uh, the, your temperature number, and you see Winnipeg frostbite in 11 minutes. Same with Steinbeck. And some of these areas to the north will get down into the, the single digits in, in numbers of minutes. Brandon, nine minutes to freeze skin with a low of minus 30 and a wind at about 20 kilometers per hour. You look to the north, seven minutes in Thompson. Your low is minus 33, and it'll be windy in Churchill and a low of minus 35, so just four minutes to freeze exposed skin. So, yes, the, the thing here is, the, the message here is to cover that exposed skin. 
Daytime highs in the northeast, including Churchill, in the minus 30s tomorrow. Across the south, we're looking at anywhere from minus 19 to minus 21 for daytime highs. A minus 19 in Winnipeg, minus 22 your high tomorrow in Barron's River. And then off into northwestern Ontario, highs anywhere from minus 16 in Fort Francis to minus 19 in Kenora and in Red Lake. Thank you, John. Thousands of people from across Canada and the United States gathered in Brandon over the weekend for Winterfest. It is a powwow that's been hosted by the Sioux Valley Dakota First Nation for more than two decades, but it was paused during pandemic restrictions. As CBC's Chelsea Camp reports, the energy was electric as people and performers were reunited for the first time in two years. The Keystone Center was alive this weekend with the sounds of singing, drums, fiddles and steppers jigging. Dakota Nation Winterfest is an annual January tradition in Brandon, but it was put on ice in 2021 and 2022. The return of the festival has been welcomed. We to bring pride to, uh, to the people, to the younger people, because loss of identity for some of them, loss of language, loss of culture. So we are bringing that back through, through powwow. To, uh, to dancing and singing. Winterfest features an indoor powwow, jigging competition, sports tournaments, and more. Sioux Valley Dakota Nation hosts the weekend of activities. The chief says it was important to reestablish the tradition to strengthen culture and bring people together. It's great to see it. It shows that, you know, we're still here, that we're strong, that we're resilient and that, you know, we're showing our younger generations the, the way of our life and the, those teachings and we're seeing them that they're picking that up and they'll carry that on in the future. Being at Winterfest in Nepal here, it's, it's like you're being at home where all your troubles and all go away and you just feel at home. Chelsea Kemp, CBC News, Brandon. Well, from a giant celebration in Brandon to a theater show that's quite unique, changes most nights and is headed to 24 different smaller communities across Manitoba and northwestern Ontario. We'll meet the artist after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Theatre lovers in 24 different communities across Manitoba and northwestern Ontario will soon have the chance to see Calgary-born actor, painter and playwright Bruce Horak perform his one-man show, Assassinating Thompson. It's a Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre regional tour, which kicks off tonight in Nipawa. This show delves into the mysterious death of famous Canadian painter Tom Thompson. He died during a canoe trip in 1917. And the story also weaves in parts of Horak's own life. I spoke with the artist this afternoon in Nipawa. Bruce Horak, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Janet. During each performance of Assassinating Thompson, you paint a portrait of the audience. What inspired that? Uh, what inspired it? Well, I, I got excited about painting um, in about 2011. I am legally blind, and a friend of mine asked me how I see. So I sat down with him, and I tried to paint a portrait of how I see the world. And uh, that began a whole adventure in portrait painting, and I'm getting close to uh, 700 portraits that I've done now since 2000 and 2011, and uh, it turned into a show because the uh, I'm a performer. I have a background in theater and regional touring and uh, doing one-person shows, and it just turned into a, a performance piece where I paint the audience and have a chat. What happens to the paintings after you make them? Well, uh, at the end of every show, I turn it around and show the audience, and they're invited to come up and take a picture, try to find themselves, and then uh, we do a live auction. And uh, the proceeds from the sale of the painting go to a local charity. Um, this year, donating the proceeds from this particular tour to Canadian Guide Dogs for the Blind. Oh, that's a fantastic cause. Yeah. You're yeah. going to be traveling to 24 communities doing 24 shows in just under yes. six weeks. Yes. <laughs> What's that kind of schedule like on a performer? Well, it can be pretty grueling, but uh, I'm so excited to be back doing it. You know, I, I cut my teeth doing regional touring in Alberta and British Columbia, all across the country. And there really is nothing like getting the chance to just have a good solid run at a show to do it night after night. Um, as a performer, I mean, that's just, yeah, it's like sharpening your pencil. It's, it's great. Uh, you know, a couple of hours in the van and uh, a really great crew to travel with. So it's it's fantastic. I get to meet people all over Manitoba and make new connections. And yeah, it's wonderful. What about painting a, a, a portrait of the audience so quickly? I mean, what does that do to your painting skills? I know you're an accomplished portrait artist. Your work is beautiful. But, but so seriously, much. having to paint that, that quickly and that <sighs> frequently, how does that change your skill? Well, I think the practice is, is so good for the skill. Um, I learn so much every time I put the, the brush to the canvas. And, you know, for myself as a... As an artist, I think probably my biggest challenge is getting started. Um, I can sit and look at a blank canvas for days and days and days and not get started and think my way out of actually working. But having to start, having to finish the portrait, having a deadline, uh, having a group of people that are engaged and you know want to see what you're working on, um, it's it's great. And I've I've found over the 700 portraits that no two are the same ever, and. Um, yeah, and I feel like I'm, I'm getting better. I have a master to get, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, neither had Tom Thompson. Mm. How, how has your opinion of him changed your, while you've been uh, touring this show? Wow. Uh, significantly. You know, my first introduction to Thompson as a painter was through a ghost story. <laughs> not, not even, we saw one, one picture of one of his works and then my art teacher in grade 11 told us the story of how Tom Thompson was murdered and his ghost haunts Algonquin Park. And that was thrilling. So I got drawn into the backstory and, you know, who, who possibly killed him and all of that before I really dug down into his, his paintings. And the further I went to the story and then began developing a show about it, I started to actually look at his work and to see, you know, I went to the National Gallery, the, the Art Gallery of Ontario and saw The West Wind and The Jack Pine, you know, his more famous works and to see them up close like that, I, I had a whole new respect for him. Um, and then just, yeah, learning about his practice, how he painted 62 landscapes in 62 days. He just kept up his painting practice and to see the evolution of it, uh, I find it very inspiring. 
That's almost a Bruce Horkak kind of schedule. <laughs> almost, almost. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and enjoy your time in our province in northwestern Ontario. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alas, he's here when it's awfully cold. John is back with your seven-day forecast after the break, and then we will bring you your daily lift. So stay with us. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. Yeah, the cold air is, is across much of the country, not just here in southern and northern Manitoba. I want to show you how extensive this warning is. And this is all extreme cold through, uh, cold through a big portion of Ontario, out into Quebec as well, Saskatchewan, northern Manitoba. And temperatures right now across Canada look like this. It is, uh, of course, a little bit warmer in the west, but minus 21 in Winnipeg, minus 24 in Regina. You get on the other side of the jet stream, it is warmer in Toronto. Windsor and kind of seasonal through Ottawa and through uh, Montreal right now. Montreal at minus nine. So in the long range, we got a little bit of a, a snowfall on Wednesday evening. Another cold day Thursday. Friday is cloudier, minus 20, some flurries around, and then we get closer 
to seasonal conditions for the weekend, minus 12s and minus 13s. Balmy. Balmy. <laughs> the people in shorts and t-shirts. Manitoba's most beloved cheerleader has now turned 60. Wow, how is that possible? <laughs> oh. Time goes so fast. Gabriel Langlois, better known as Dancing Gabe, celebrated his birthday at yesterday's Manitoba Moose Game. Here's your daily lift. I like to thank the young and old and children of all ages. I like to keep on dancing. You know, to have that many connections and for him to be as engaged with all of us, it means a lot to me. I'm born and raised Winnipegger, so I've, I've seen Gabe dancing since uh, I was born. And it just, to be able to do this for him meant so much to us. But personally, I'm, I'm just kind of honored that I could be a part of it as well. Just wanted to wish you a huge happy birthday, Gabe. Uh, thank you so much for bringing so much energy to uh, Canada Life Centre over the years. I love the make, make the fans smile. Yay! Happy birthday, Gabe. Happy birthday, buddy. You know we've known him for so long. So long. Keep dancing for years to come. Keep dancing, man. <laughs> Let's all keep dancing because it's cold out there. Yeah, exactly.